Hello, everyone, and thank you for listening to this episode of the Refold Podcast, where we talk about everything related to language learning. My name is Clayton, also known as George Pig, and I manage the community here at Refold. Today, we have a very special guest, uh, a great guest, actually. It's a fantastic episode, Adam Ola from the Korean Anytime Podcast. Join us as we talk all about immersion learning and Korean. We are recording. So, Adam Ola, it is great to have you on. Pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. I won't lie. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you want to give a brief introduction of yourself? Yeah. So, my name is Adam Ola. Um, I'm a university student. I'm a junior. Um, I go to school in DC. Um, and I've been learning Korean for the better part of, like, officially started learning Korean January of 2020. Discovered the immersion method via the Matt vs. Japan YouTube channel on. June 2nd of 2020, and then officially started immersion on July 1st and never looked back. Basically, yeah. All right, you got the date down. Yeah. <laughs> and you're also active in different communities, the Refold Discord, yeah. uh, the Magaku community as well. Yeah. And um, you've also made some community resources. You made like a really giant uh, playlist of web dramas once upon right, a time. Right, right. Yeah, that's All right. right. And in addition to all that cool stuff, you also have your own podcast with George. That's true. The Korean Always Podcast. Yeah. All right. So I have some questions. The first off is Adam Ola jumped out to me as a Yoruba name. Mm. So does your family have Yoruba, like a, a yes. Yoruba background? Yes, you are very correct. Yeah, my name, Adam Ola, is Yoruba, my entire family. So my mother and father, they are both from Nigeria. Um, my okay. mom being from Lagos, and they actually had my older brother. And then when they came to the United States, I was born like a couple years later. So I was born in 02. Um, and I have two other brothers. But yeah, my name is Yoruba Adamola. Adiemi is my full name. Um, even my middle name. <laughs> if I say my full, my full, full name, it's Adamola Uluwabemiga Adiemi. And it's all yeah, Yoruba those, meanings. <laughs> those jump out. Those jump yeah. out. So. My childhood doctor was Nigerian. Oh, wow, so, really? Dr. Oluwale Olusala. Oh, yeah. Um, and I'm, I also am friends with his son. Do you know Pentatonics? They're a group. I they do guess like I've acapella. heard of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm friends with Kevin Olusala's younger brother. So he, wow. yeah, he's in that group. And uh, the, the Yoruba name jumped out at me. And I was like, this is cool. So that makes you a heritage speaker, I guess, of Yoruba. Well... You could say that if I actually spoke the language well. <laughs> oh, okay. My family, while my parents, they communicate with it often. When I was a child, they weren't, it wasn't the highest priority for me to mm -hmm. learn the language, it seemed. Um, so I don't actually speak the language to the level I wish I did, if I was to put it anyway. So I'm not like, okay. I wouldn't say I'm fluent in Yoruba is like what I'd say. Um, but I understand like, yeah. the language. It's an interesting language. People don't know this. When people think tonal languages, they jump right. to Asia. They jump to Chinese right, right, and right. Thai. But uh, West African languages are tonal. Right. Yoruba is a tonal language. Uh, and its grammar, I hear, is more like Chinese and English than Korean. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's the, it's the grammar. And I, I know I haven't actually spent like a crazy amount of time studying. It was more like my parents speak it. I hear it in songs. Yeah. We go to like church in Europe and we have to sing the prayers and et cetera. Um, but like when it came, like I remember I spent like one year in high school where I was like, mom, like, I, I guess I want to like at least study a little bit. And she was just taking me through like the ABCs to like the grammar. And it wasn't like as different as you'd say Korean with Korean grammar would be compared to English. Um, but yeah, you're mm -hmm. definitely right. And like it has a lot of similarities with Chinese was the one thing that I was like, well, wow, it's actually really interesting. I didn't really, I didn't even know that myself before I started studying it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's exciting, but it's pretty, pretty normal. I think for children, uh, you know, children of immigrants to not prioritize the language, you know, a lot of parents right. want people to integrate. And then at least with some communities like uh, Filipinos, Nigerians, usually the family already has a pretty decent level of English for various right. reasons. Right, so integration, right. as they call it, is a lot easier. And uh, the kids tend not to learn, at least until they're older, and they can right. teach themselves. 
would you say that's on your your hit list after you totally master korean would you like to delve into your sort of your family's uh language oh yeah definitely like it, it's come across my head more and more um the past couple months just like i've even like looking um because even i discussed with this with my my brothers as well because all of us we don't actually speak the language to like the level in which our parents would at least be satisfied or be allowed like a genuine conversation um so it's always been something that's been on my mind and definitely something i think i'm going to hit on in the next we'll see we'll see what i'm when i'm done with korean but uh, until then yeah it's definitely something i want to get to oh, i think that's awesome yeah. and uh it's definitely it can be like a whole can of worms when like you know uh i see it all the time in the refold community heritage learners or you know they want to learn japanese or korean and they have interest right. and and stuff and then sometimes there's like family pressure and sometimes yeah. it can like it you know it's a whole can of worms probably uh, a bit beyond the scope of this podcast but good luck and that's exciting let me know i would definitely listen to a uh, yoruba anytime podcast <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah i'll definitely let you guys know yeah so Adamola, you were kind of famous in the refold community back when you used to to mod for being a uh, really into web dramas. Mm. Yeah. So it's been a few years, and what is your stance on them now? Oh yeah, you know, uh, for those of you who don't know, web dramas are like a form of. I'd like to say it's most specifically popular in Korean media. Um, it's like a form of short form dramas, generally targeting teenagers. Um, where it's like you take a drama that in generally a Korean drama episodes are like 60 minutes long with 16 episodes. Instead, these dramas are entire seasons that are cut down or that are basically like five to 10 minute episodes with seasons that are as long as like 100 to 120 minutes. Uh, usually when you're approaching like in the most, the longest seasons you'll see are like four hour long seasons, which is like very much more compact than your general drama you'd see in a K drama. Um, so at that time, I won't lie, like the first couple months I was learning Korean, that was the most accessible media to my comprehension. Because, you know, what we look for is comprehensible input. And like through all the media that I'd seen across like in Kore like Korean media, it was the one form that I was like, yo, I can actually like understand. And I'm still I'm still like it's not too far off the walls for me. Like it's close enough that. I'm learning enough new things to keep it interesting, but at the same time, it's not like uh, too easy to the point where like I'm like, oh, okay, I'm bored. Um, so at the time, yeah, I was watching a lot of web dramas. At that time, every How long is your day, playlist? Oh, so I made the two famous playlist. playlist. You, know? you got had, two, okay. Well, the it was the the playlist that I had brought to Refold was a combination of the two. So the okay. way I did it was. I had one where I'd go and search for web dramas across the internet. I just search web dramas, most recently added, and add every single web drama on YouTube. And then I had another, which I called my watched web dramas. So I kind of like separated stuff, content I've already seen and content that was new. Um, so at that time, I breached within like a year. I think I watched 100 to 150, 60 web dramas. But the total playlist, I think, is like 200 to 200, between 200. I think it's almost at 200 at this point. Um, so I actually haven't seen every web drama, but definitely just looking for them. I, I like would watch peek at them and be like, oh, okay, this is interesting. Someone might like that and just add it. I won't lie. I was addicted to them. In, and I don't know if I you can say I'm proud of that, but it was like, it was. I was always just searching comprehensibility, language gains. I don't care if it's cringe. And you know a lot of a lot of the uh, the people that look at the web dramas and kind of like are like I don't know if I can watch that. It's, they they can be pretty cringy sometimes, like because the content is not it's not the greatest writing in the world. Um, looking back now, I I don't think I've watched a web drama in like months, uh, especially because the past couple months I, I've just been like engaging in Korea. Um, but uh, yeah, web dramas I still highly recommend them to anyone who's starting Korean. It's like really like they use the same vocab all the time you can always get that refresher of old vocab you saw in a previous episode very few were i didn't have to look up crazy amounts of words and i felt like within like a couple months i reached like a really really high level of comprehensibility which then was like okay now i can understand korean you know so 
So yeah, that was how Web, Web Pajamas, I honestly think, were the one of the greatest influences in me getting close to like, how can I get closer to more like natural Korean? It's not the most natural, but it is like a very accessible form of content for a relative beginner intermediate, you know. All right. So it sounds like web dramas were very uh, influential oh, yeah. and they were a fundamental part of your immersion. So you mentioned four hour seasons and short form content. So yeah. um, I have ADDPI. I love things that don't last longer than 15 <laughs> minutes. Right. How long does a usual episode of a web drama last? Well, yeah. So you can find web dramas that episodes are like six minutes long. And then you can move to the next episode, which the plot just always continues, continues, continues like that. Um, the longest episodes that I saw, like nowadays, um, or at least the past couple of years, there have been even web dramas that have been uh, working together with like big Korean like develop like uh, filming companies. And those web dramas, those can you can see them like thirty minute long episodes, so like half the length of like your average drama to like less than ten minute long episodes, which is like really accessible if you are like you can't sit down for 60 minutes for a K drama on Netflix like that yeah so what are the big differences between like a K drama and a web drama in terms of language everything okay so first of all when you say K drama obviously we know there's a bunch of genres there's like the right. crime and i mean it's very similar with web dramas they also have a lot of genres it's just with web dramas because they are targeting more teen audiences uh, you can expect the vocab isn't going to be like crazy high level of like police jargon and like jargon that you'd hear in like the courtroom all the time or generally it's it's very close to that what was the word that um i remember matt you said it's like a slice of life or what's the word like basically okay. the kind of language you'll hear every day it's closer to that because it's like teenagers talking with fellow teenagers or high schoolers talking with high schoolers. Uh, they take place a lot in high school, that college scene. Um, so it's definitely targeting the youth when it comes to their genres. Um, so like you can expect to hear, uh, oh, I guess the biggest trope you'll see in web dramas are like love, romance, you know, K-dramas with their uh, oppas and nunas and <laughs> yeah, that, that kind of stuff. So um, that's a very popular, uh, routes you'll see you'll see that a lot in web dramas but there's also been like the past couple of years i saw there's a lot more i'd like to say cooler like even action-based web dramas and um horror web dramas uh which i really enjoyed um, we actually even did a couple streams of some of those newer web dramas uh, a couple of years ago so that was that was something that i feel like web dramas they really are it's almost like they're upgrading every year that they're coming out and it's, it's very close to that K-drama-esqueness, but it's nowhere near like the level of vocab. Like the vocab level you'll see in a K-drama can be like easy to like extremely hard. But while in a web drama, it's very close to easy to intermediate. It keeps it within this range. Well, you, you will see like little bits of like that more difficult high level vocab, but since an episode is only six minutes long, like they can't spend two minutes talking in that kind of language, you know what I mean? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when people uh, first start learning a language, they expect they expect it to be always the same level. But the reality is, is that if you're watching um, an adult show, mm. there might be a scene that you totally understand. Most of right. it you might understand when they're, they're in the car and they're talking to their girlfriend or their wife, and then there mm. might be like a procedural bit where they're in a courtroom <laughs> or something, right. and all of a sudden right. you're hit with l legal jargon. Exactly, and it's exactly. really... Yeah, so it sounds sort of like uh, web drama sidestep some of that issue. Right, exactly. And that's that's where so, I found like the passion or at least that connection to the, the language grind with them. Yeah, it sounds to me like you did a lot of listening and watching with your immersion learning. So do you want to maybe explain uh, what your stand, like how you did immersion learning? Yeah, um, so yes, um, I'd like to say, so like I said, July 1st was the day that I officially marked on my calendar, I'm going to start immersion. And the things that I was doing in that period between that June 2nd, when I discovered Matt versus Japan's channel and July 1st was I actually did a lot. I basically just went like 
how much can I learn about immersion and how this works? Like, can I trust this guy, Matt? Like, how far is this immersion thing really? How, like, what's the, the, the take on it? And I basically just watched all of his videos. And then I even went on the Patreon and listened to, I basically would go and search questions like, okay, what is this? And then I, I see like he has the Q and A's. So I just scroll through every single Q and A, click on this, this, the, the, thumb, the, what's it called? The thumb stamp or whatever it is for the question and listen to that and be like, okay, okay, okay. All right. Got to add that. And one of the things that really stuck with me uh, was the fact that in the, the beginning days, he would always emphasize if you want to have a really good accent, what are the requirements that you need to take? And one of the things that you used to always mention was listening, 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 because the impacts that reading can impact on your listening is kind of like it's throwing. So when you listen, the more you listen, the more you listen, that's how you get better at listening. It's kind of like self-explanatory, um, but um, it's almost like the more you listen versus the amount you read, you kind of want to, the amount of reading versus listening. Um, the way I took it was I need to spend like, 80 to 90% of my time listening if I want some real gains. And then when I'm making cards, like making sentence cards, um, I'll read because I'll look at subtitles and put them in my Anki and so I can rep them. Uh, but for the most part, I started like that. I think my first couple months, I did not use subtitles, uh, which is something uh, that honestly, I felt really challenged my ear. And because I was like so in on like, I must do it the right way, I must do it the way. Um, I got really into it to the point where like weeks in, I was like, I can actually like parse the sounds in the language, even though I couldn't read them very, very well at that time. Um, so I remember I was getting into listening, 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 Then eventually I was like, all right, got to like really grind on sentence mining. And for the most part, from the beginning up until actually now I prioritized like audio on the front of my cards and then the sentence on the back. So that's some of the things that I did. Um, I basically, I think I have like. I have 7,000 to somewhere between 7,000 and like 8,000 cards um, in my Inky. And I basically just be repping them. Every single card that has audio from a show, audio is on the front. Listen to the audio, try and put myself in that situation. All right, would I understand this if I was like talking to someone? And then if I did, then I'd rep it, continue. If I didn't, then I'd look at the back, read the card and be like, okay, got to make sure I'm able to hear it. So I really prioritize my listening. And I think that's played quite the role in uh, kind of helping me like work on my accent, kind of grinding and like figuring out how can I better my speech. At the time, I didn't 100% know it, but I trusted it. And I think, I think for the most part, it's worked out pretty well. Um, I just, yeah, overall. Ah, so it sounds like you took a really listening heavy approach. And that's interesting. So Korean has that interesting sort of three-way stop distinction uh the mm. tense sort of lacks like mm. pa versus ba versus right. the other one that i can't do yeah. and uh yeah yeah so i was kind of wondering so before our uh our interview today i probed the community i was like guys i've got adam ola finally uh mm -hmm. let's get some good questions and I feel like half the questions were about listening and oh, yeah. now I understand why, because yeah. you were very heavy on listening. Yeah. So in addition to like listening to native content, did you ever do any CI like comprehensible input content? So that's something that's gotten really big with like channels like dreaming Spanish mm. where they sort of talk at you and they, they might like draw pictures and does that content Ooh. really exist for Korean? Oh, and did you ever yeah. use any? You know, I definitely know that it does exist in Korean. I didn't really get into it that much. I know like some other people in the community would, um, I, I, I saw some really good ones. So while, while I wasn't actively like, oh, let me watch the next episode type of stuff. But when I like scroll the internet or YouTube for like different content that they have for Korean, I definitely have seen like there's different like really solid channels um, where people are like, where they draw something and say it or like show like opening the door, walking mm -hmm. into the house and they kind of like, speak it out loud comprehensible you know the, the visual plus the hearing plus you know obviously um so for the most part yeah it exists but i don't think i use it that much i don't really use it very much at all uh, for myself i kind of was just like all you, native content native content native content. you jumped right into native content that's tough i feel like a lot of um a lot of people in the well in the community it's less uncommon but i feel like outside of the community when we get into right. more like um sometimes what we call normies, it's a little <laughs> bit harder for them. You know, if you're talking right. to a person who 
they sort of got into like the the TT, you know, talk to me in Korean, right, 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 right. and maybe Duolingo, mm. and they're not ready for that sort of intense listening. Yeah, I feel like CI offers your sort of your average Joe a way into immersion learning, sort right. of like training wheels. And you know, I was a normie also. I was not because you know there are folks okay. that kind of discovered immersion and then decided to learn a language. Myself, like I mentioned. I had already started learning Korean in January of 2020. And what I was doing then was very close to that kind of talk to me in Korean. Pimsler, um, watching Korean Unni, or like she's like a grammar YouTuber. She like explained different Korean slang. And I basically just, or uh, Korean Englishman. I watched those sorts of channels to kind of get my contact with the language. I wasn't really into like the gist of like watching okay. content in Korean, I can learn, that makes no sense, was what I was thinking before. But eventually after discovering it, I kind of already had a little background in grammar. I already had a background in vocab to a, a certain degree. foundation. Right, right. Okay. That's what so I that, can say, yeah. Okay, that makes sense to me mentally, like understanding that you did have a foundation in traditional learning before jumping into like, yeah. you know, web dramas. Right. Exactly. So you mentioned the your Anki cards. You mm -hmm. mine the sentences, I guess, and yes. you do audio only. Audio on the front and then sentences on the back. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're actually about to release the new Korean 1K deck at Refold. Ooh. And uh, one of the questions I got from a community member was actually, you know, would it be a good idea to do an, to, to rep it, but rep it audio only? So I'm looking forward to it. Um, the new deck, I think, is going to have, don't quote me on this, I think it's going to have a standard soul voice this time. Oh, I think yeah, the, yeah. I think our old version had a very strong Busan accent. Yeah, it, yes, right. I actually, um, funny, funny kind of downside, I actually met them <laughs> that made oh. the, the refold deck. I met them when I went to Korea. <laughs> you uh, met, so uh, I, I, I guess it was, it was Ian, Ian and his and, partner. Right, yeah. Yes, and they have a taco stand now or something. I hear yeah, they do. Good. Yeah, they do. Yeah, I didn't get to go unfortunately because I, I didn't spend enough time in Busan. But yeah, they're really nice. They're really kind guys. They're really good folks. Yeah, I hear good things about Ian's uh, Busanese, his ability to understand the Busan oh, dialect and communicate oh, in it. Oh man, don't get me started. That man's Ian. He, yeah, he's got the Busan down to a nail. Like just, I, even just hearing him speak Korean, I was just like, "Yeah, this guy Ian, yeah, you know, he's, he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing here. He's done the immersion work." Yeah, yeah, he definitely. Uh, he he feels like sometimes he's more Busanese than some people who are f coming from outside of Busan. Yeah, and they're Korean, but they're not from Busan. He's like, right. "No, we don't do that here in Busan." Like, you know, he's more <laughs> Busanese than some Koreans who have yeah. come to Busan from outside of Busan. Yeah, that's exactly and, it. That's exactly it. Yeah, cool. Well, I definitely uh, like the first deck, but I think, I think people, especially people coming from like the more like TT and MIK stuff, were like, mm. "This doesn't sound like what I hear in my talk to me in Korean," you know, uh, right. and. It was confusing to people. So I think the, the new Korean deck, Ian is still going to promote it, but I think that mm. we have a new voice. It's going to be Ooh. something more like Seoul. But oh, definitely to, yeah. to the people who were asking, should you rep it audio only, go for it. It sounds like sounds like Adam Ola has signed off on it. Sorry. And yeah. I can definitely now, say when it comes to, like obviously the perspective, the perspective that's repping it audio only, Kind of comes with the uh, when you rep it audio only. My thought is, okay, how can I simulate a realistic um, ex like environment of talking to someone in Korean? It's almost like I almost close my eyes, imagine myself in front of this person and them talking to me, or there's a situation in front of me and they're talking. And my idea is, I need to like simulate in my brain. All right, I'm in this situation. I'm in the same area. How am I interpreting the emotion? How am I interpreting their vocal? And when you kind of like have that mindset when you listen, it really helps put you in the circumstance and under the understanding even comes with like putting yourself there. Uh, it's something that I found like really helped with my comprehension in, even in itself. Um, so like the difference between that and then learning nouns, um, for noun learning, sometimes just like reading it on a paper is just easier. It's like, okay, that's a table, that's bread. 
like that kind of thing. So that, that's mm -hmm. my perspective on it. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard that sometimes concrete nouns can be very easy to learn. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned imagining yourself because I feel like that's one thing that I also used to be a normie language learner. I did Pimsleur. I did and, Pimsleur too. And Pimsleur, one of the things they tell you to do is imagine you're at a bar, right? Yeah. And yeah, they, yeah. they they do that very technique. So it sounds like yeah. um it sounds like maybe that might have influenced you there. Uh, yeah. you found it effective or something, or maybe it's convergent, but interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So with the pure listening, what would your recommendations be for like a rank beginner, someone just getting into Korean? Would you recommend that they do what you did and like jump straight into web dramas? Or do you think that they should spend some time with some beginner content, whether it be traditional stuff, uh, talk to me in Korean or maybe CI channels? What would your recommendations be? Right. Because that's usually the, the main issue is as an absolute beginner content that in any way you can actually listen to and not feel like you're being drowned out to a degree. Um, like obviously personally, I kind of was like, I, I just had like this mindset of like, I know I don't understand it now, but like eventually if I just keep paying attention and put 120% to my ears, I'll pick it up. And then eventually I started picking it up. Um, but as like an absolute, absolute beginner, um, there are, um, there were a couple of resources I used even before I discovered immersion, um, to kind of work on listening. Um, there's actually a couple of books by talk to me in Korean. So talk to me in Korean had, I think it was called like intermediate expressions, um, or something like that. There's like a book called that. I'll probably, I'll figure it out and let you guys know. Um, but in that book, they also provided free audio to every single conversation that was in those books. And I guess those books, I guess that would be what you were talking about. Like comprehensible input kind of stuff because it was a lot more dumbed down language it wasn't mm. like 100 percent natural korean um but it was they never ooh. are you know yeah, right right, right I, yeah. i've met a lot of people um who you know maybe if you travel if you go to taiwan or something where english is not super strong they're like oh how do you do are you fine and it's it's understandable but it definitely sounds a little bit like a textbook Right, right, exactly. So th there is that content. I would say that helped me. I remember even before like immersion was a thought that gave me more confidence uh, just listening to that free provided um, audio for those uh, conversations. Because then I listened to it, be like, oh, I actually understood an entire conversation. You know, that's motivating. Which once you do want to keep going. Um, so like I did, I listened to like that entire book. That was a beginner book. And then they also had an intermediate book. And I listened to that entire book. And funny enough, I even would go outside on walks, listening to that audio on repeat. Just like listening. This is before I even knew anything about immersion. I was just like, I got to listen. I gotta, I'm, I'm getting better. Like I was kind of that repetitive listening. I think there was actually Jeremy from Motivate Korean, which is actually the channel that Ian is taking over. I'm not sure if those some of you guys who might have been in the immersion learning space or Korean language learning space, like a couple, quite a few couple years ago, Jeremy had this channel called Motivate Korean. And one of the things he, he was like a really good speaking uh, guy from America, Korean speaking guy from America. And he always mentioned repetitive listening, repetitive listening, repetitive listening. Um, so that's something I started doing before I even thought of like, oh, this is actually helping my ears in like a way that it, we talked about in the input method kind of thing. Um, but yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. And actually, um, there's someone in the immersion language learning space. He's been in the, geez, he's been in the language learning s sort of spheres of influence yeah. for over a decade. Uh, on Refold, he goes by Crush. And um, he's our, he's like a Cantonese admin. And he, he has been language learning as a hobby very intensely since... Mm. Uh, since you were basically it's still in elementary school oh. and he is a big fan of repetitive listening every day he wakes up and he listens over and over and over and over to different things whether it's audiobooks um and uh i think right now he's listening to um dune in portuguese by accident he bought it thinking it was spanish uh <laughs> and it ended up being portuguese but he's just decided to listen to it and cool. he's quite apparently quite good at a variety of languages he's one of the few 
true polyglots in the community. And oh, yeah. he does a whole bunch of repetitive listening. Mm, a whole bunch. There's something to it, huh? Well, yeah, I mean, like, I guess the question with repetitive listening always comes down to what's the length of the content that we're repetitively listening to? So, like, because right. obviously I can listen to something that's a one minute long audio strip a billion times in a day. But is that better than me listening to an hour long drama like a hundred times in a day? And personally, I kind of went towards the listening to an hour long drama a hundred times in a day. Mm -hmm. Just like put it on repeat in the, in the back of the room, doing homework for school. It's like, bam, 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 more repetition, repetition. And, and that's like falls... diverse enough that you can listen to it more and more. I felt. Yeah, yeah. that falls in line with uh, refold recommendations of mm -hmm. usually going through and intensively or interacting with your immersion, like doing lookups and then right. later going back and listening to sort of in the background, right. the same audio. Right. So. Yeah, that seems to fall in line with what Refold recommends. I do not do a lot of repetition. Mm. I, uh, I, I I chalk it up to my ADD, um, but <laughs> I, I avoid repetition. But I think it can yeah. be quite effective. And people also sometimes play the uh, their Anki cards over and over and over. So yeah. I don't think I was ever that much of a like oh Anki cards over and over i feel like I, I get really bored of that too quickly i mean sometimes i enjoy if i enjoy my cards i'm like oh yeah i want to listen to that one one more time but yeah i don't know if i was the Anki kind of guy i was like i need longer content kind of stuff podcasts that'd be it too yeah now you went to korea right right yeah and when you went to korea a couple of cool stuff cool things happened um i think you finally got to meet george from I your did. podcast yeah uh, how was that? Oh, oh, like, oh, it was so nice. It was so cool to finally, because, um, because like George, we started this podcast together. Actually, uh, the Korean Always podcast. We started in December of twenty twenty one. Was it two? It was twenty twenty one? Because twenty twenty three now. Yeah, twenty twenty one, and we met actually funny enough via another YouTuber, a Korean YouTuber. That be it. Um, our good friend Jongin, who had this uh, channel, some some of you guys might have known. This is Big Data, um, but now his channel is, channel is called Parak Daki, uh, uh, which is like scrubbing the floor. Um, and his channel, he kind of interviewed us. He interviewed me, talking about like I think at that point it was like three thousand hours uh, when I had like three thousand hours recorded in, in, in my immersion. Um, and he interviewed me and then I saw an interview by, he did for George and George was like speaking Korean in it. And I'm like, yo, who is this kid? And eventually we got connected on discord. Um, and then we just kept it up. We actually started immersing together and we'd always have conversations about how can we like improve. And we were both really on like a very similar plane in our immersion learning, like in even our Korean learning like space. So, uh, we really connected. And eventually, obviously, when I was like, I'm going to Korea, the previous uh, couple months before I was going, he was already going for his birthday. And he's now studying like full time as a student there, he still lives there uh, to this day. Um, and when I arrived and I pulled up on the, the Chiachot on the, um, the subway and I came out to see this six, four, six, three tall white guy. And I'm like, yo, it's George. <laughs> we just like, we, I saw we dapped him up when it had some great lunch and it was kind of cool. It's like you, you meet people online and you never know if it's like going to be the same as your interactions. Like we were talking for a better part of like a year and a half and it's like, oh, is he going to be the same cool guy? And yeah, he is. He is the same cool guy he is online. Yeah. Always great meeting your discord friends and yeah. uh, <laughs> getting over that fear. Like, is it going to be different in person? And it sounds right. like uh, you and George are stronger now after having met. Uh, oh, yeah. Now, before you went to Korea and mm. after you went to Korea, mm. did that change how you studied Korean? Yeah. Um, so like, funny enough, when I decided I was going to Korea, that was around 2000. Um, I want to say it was, it was March of the previous year. So March of 2022. March 2022, and then I basically was like, all right, I know I'm going to Korea, which means output is in inevitable. Output is inevitable. There's no more skipping on output because for, for the most part, it was like, try not to output as much to preserve the accent, you know? 
want to at least refine your accent as much as possible before you start outputting, you know, make sure the input is at a high enough level for you to say, I can hear my own mistakes. That was the, the idea that I was sticking to. And so once I decided I was going, I was like, that means I got to start practicing. So the shadowing entered um, my routine, shadowing, and then going heavy on the texting and language exchange. And then eventually up to like about a month before I left on my plane, on my plane to go to Korea, I was doing as many hours of phone calls with Korean people as much as possible. So I would like, I'd be on the phone for like four to five hours some days talking to a friend that I met um, in Korea. And we'd just be like, I'd, I'd be helping them with English. But for the most part, like if I'm being honest, I was trying to speak Korean. So I was just like, oh yeah, more Korean. They were, and because I was at that point, um, the consensus that they would always be like, oh my God, you're so good. You're so good. It kind of made it easier for me to kind of just keep the conversation in Korean. Um, and I definitely feel that one month that I spent before I went to Korea really, really like actually like allowed me to like um, self-actualize, actually kind of like my Korean speaking ability. Because um, for the most part, my texting, I was, get, I was reaching a point where I was feeling like pretty comfortable. I didn't really have to think too much. I could I was even getting like slang into my vocab, talking with people my own age. And then speaking, it was kind of like, all right, let me just not be like, uh, for lack of a better word, not be like a, a stupid kid. Let me actually do this. Let me stop being like scared of speaking. I need to actually do it. It's going to happen. Um, so I was just like, I got to do it every day, every day, every day. And then eventually it came to fruition when I arrived in Korea and had to have my first conversation. So uh, yeah, I, I think like the study method, uh, as far as like what I did before, I, I was really stringent with Anki and I will not lie, I have not done Anki reps in what feels like six months. <laughs> I basically stopped doing Anki that week I went to Korea or the week before I went to Korea. I was kind of like, you know what? I don't know. I won't lie. It's a little bit of shame for me because Anki was like the one habit that you maintain. And if you maintain that habit, then you're like, you have, you have nothing holding you back. Just like build everything around the habit. But then me kind of losing that habit, I won't lie. It's something I kind of regret. I still, to this day, I'm like trying to recover from that time I spent off Anki. Um, but it is what it is. Eventually, I'll get back. I think I, I have like 2,000 or... 2,700 reviews, so eventually I'll, I'll get back. <laughs> that is yeah. why people maintain the habit, I think, because it yeah, yeah. punishes you. It does. Uh, it does, yeah. Yeah, and it's going to keep punishing you. Um, there are different techniques. Like... Yeah, there are different techniques to, to get around that and to get back in the swing. I'm not going to suggest any because I also do not... <laughs> do not use Anki, <laughs> so I would not be the person Ooh, to... Okay, gotcha. Yeah, um, I would not be the person to give that advice, but there are some techniques. I think some people recommend, like, filtering your deck and, uh, you know, turning off new cards and then, like, mm. reviewing separately and having a separate deck for what used to be the new cards in the old deck. And, like, there are different strategies because you're not the first yeah. person to, like, fall off the Anki wagon. Yeah. And I mean, I guess one thing that I could say that I kind of forgot, something that almost replaced Anki for me, or I wouldn't say replaced Anki, but something that I was doing those months leading up to my time leaving for Korea, that kind of, I felt like, yo, I don't need Anki, was I was actually working on a project with Migaku on, on making um, a Korean uh, learner's uh, kind of deck using this, like some really advanced program. I don't know how much I can say about it. But um, mm -hmm. essentially, it was like we were making an I plus one deck. So like introduced, we did a bunch of research into like the grammar, vocab, and we, we just, I don't, I don't know how much I can actually talk about this. But for the most part, I think I can. Um, it was like we made a deck, I plus one, every, every new sentence introduced either a grammar or a word. And we worked, I worked in closely with a Korean um, teacher from Korea. And we had we spent hours talking to each other. Actually, um, for the most part, it was in English. I won't lie, um, but occasionally I'd be like, "Hey, can we talk in Korean?" And then we talk in Korean and go over meetings on discussing the vocab and changes that need to be made with the grammar, introduction, new grammar. And that was probably the one thing that I was doing that kind of kept me like on my toes because I was not only reviewing grammar, working on this this giant deck we were doing, 
Um, but I also was, I was also like making sure my vocab was together and how I use vocab because I'm talking with someone who's literally teaches Korean grammar to students that study Korean. So that was definitely one thing I was like, oh, I'm confident now. So I kind of like slowed down on Anki. I think that's probably what happened to me. Yeah. Right. So that time you spent uh, talking and outputting and then having yeah. closely working with a, a, a Korean speaker sort of yeah. replaced on key. And I think that's fine. I mean, think about how repetitive the just the daily conversations we have, even in English are, you know, like, hey, what's up, man? How you doing? Oh, I'm doing all right. I'm going great. How's, you know, yeah. how's the wife? Right. How's the class? How's, you know, right. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I think ultimately life is pretty boring, which is why we have gay dramas <laughs> <laughs> to be less boring. <laughs> So we tend to have that's, the same right. conversations and you get that sort of organic yeah. space repetition. So that's right. Yeah. Why did you start learning Korean? Oh yeah. So the big why. Um, so funny enough, um, I remember, I think it was my junior year of high school. Um, actually, no, it goes even further back than that. Um, okay. eighth grade, eighth grade of middle school. Um, I got a video in my YouTube recommended and that video said how to learn how to read Korean in just five minutes. So I saw this video and I was like, no way. Like, what do you mean learn an entire Asian language script in five minutes? Like, is it like Chinese? Like you can't spend five minutes learning Chinese. So I was an ignorant kid too. Um, so I watched this video and essentially it just teaches you Hangul, which is the Korean writing system. And funny enough, I just spent probably more than five minutes, but maybe like 40 minutes re-watching the video, practicing like, okay, that's kiok, that's jiok, that's a dub, that's a sangyo. Like I was like studying the grammar system in eighth grade to the point where I learned how to read. And I was like, banana, which is how you say banana in Korean. I was like, oh my God, I can read Korean. And I would go into school and be like, hey guys, look, I can read this Wikipedia page. And I open a Wikipedia page and be like, uh, blah, 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 reading Korean. And then people are like, oh, that's so cool. But like, do you understand what you're saying? And then it hit me and I was like, nah, I don't, wait a second. Oh, that's hard. How do I understand what I'm saying? And that's when I gave up. I was like, nope, not gonna learn this. <laughs> so funny enough, I kind of gave up at that point. Um, and it wasn't until um, my freshman year of high school, I had a Korean math teacher. Her name was Miss John and she had a very thick Korean English accent uh, to the point where uh, I recall people would say, don't take her class. Like, I can't understand that woman. Like, you, you might fail if you can't understand her was how people would talk about her. Um, but I was like, they oh, it's going to be that be bad, guys. Like, They can sometimes be pretty strong. I um, Yeah, yeah. I you've used heard, to work heard. for like sort of a virtual hagwon when I used to be an oh, English yeah. teacher. Oh, yeah. And I heard the word frozen. Mm. pronounced as progen yeah that's like the, the, you see yeah the sounds it's like what where did you get that but then once you yeah, understand like how to read once korean, you're used to it and you're right, exposed exactly. to the korean english it's fine yeah. it's just like any other variety of english but exactly if you have never interacted with a korean speaker of english you might hear progen it can be challenging and yeah and be like what did i uh so, right right so like students in the class mind you we're all like 15 year old kids um, so I remember it was like, we sitting in class and she's talking, talking, talking and kids be like, oh my gosh, like, I can't take this. But for me, I honestly was entertained. I was enjoying the class. And, uh, that was funny enough. I actually did the best I had performed in any math class in my entire life. I think I got like a 98.4% or something and other students had failed <laughs> because of, I have no idea. <laughs> Um, but within the class, she would actually talk about um, how she was from Korea and she even integrated um, discussions about Korea within the math um, because of there were like several times where like we'd actually question her and have opportunities to talk with her. And I just got like really interested. And I, was, I got really close with her. And then over the course of high school, um, I just always like greeted her, talked with her. And she mentioned like how Korean is a very hard language, like not very many people can really learn it. And, I was kind of like, oh, really? Okay, okay. I didn't really think too much of it. But my senior year, this was like 2020, um, I was like, you know what? I think 
I want to learn. At this point, I had already had the idea of learning a language. Um, but it was kind of like that plus Korean had somehow entered my life in one way. And then I was like, you know what? Let me learn enough Korean to greet her goodbye during my graduation. So the plan was that I would learn January. It was January 7th, I want to say. It was January 7th where I started like grinding, pop, pop, grind, 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 grind. And the one sad part about that was like, I think it was like uh, March, COVID hits the world like with a right hook. That's a left hook. Um, but it hits the world and we're out of school for 10 days, which turns into three weeks, which turns into two months. And I don't even have a graduation. So I actually couldn't even see her. Um, but without with this period of like free time from COVID, it kind of gave me an opportunity to like, you know what? Hey, I'm already learning this language. Got to grind. Like it's grind season. Like I'm, I'm only like, I think Korean it was, 18, was your 19. COVID hobby. It was my COVID hobby. That was exactly what it was. It was like, hey, I got nothing else to do better. So might as well learn a new skill. I, I'm graduating from high school now. I can use this, this skill for like the rest of my life if I really do good. So I just like was like every day, almost every day. I didn't have enough discipline at that point. I won't lie because I was still in school. So I'd be like day, 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 like entire week, skip like another week, another week, skip a week, do another week uh, to the point where it reached the time where I would have had a graduation. But that ended up just being a, uh, they gave us a flash drive for their graduation. <laughs> I got a flash drive that holds my entire graduation. Um, so I didn't actually get to see her. But as I told you, June 2nd comes around in Matt versus Japan. I see this video saying, why wow, you still don't understand your target language. And that video, I think I, I put a comment on that video actually. And I said, this was the greatest video I've ever seen. I'm subscribing, blah. And then from that point on, I kind of like haven't looked back. Uh, and yeah, that's basically how I started. Adamola origin story. That was actually <laughs> very interesting. It it was not like a, a love of web dramas that brought you into Korean. It was uh, <laughs> just you being a young person yeah. and then having a Korean teacher. And, you know, right. uh, that was a great origin story. Yeah. So and here we are today and you're much oh, better yeah. at Korean. How yeah, many hours and... have you put into Korean? Oh, you know, I, I used to. So you the used first, to track, and now you don't. I used to track, and I don't now. I, I literally stopped tracking the day I left for Korea. So since that time, I don't have data. But if I was to look at my, if I was to actually look at my data, I think I had one year where I put in four. I, I don't want to like over say my numbers, but I think I had like somewhere four thousand, almost five thousand hours. That's including passive. Um, I can, I'll probably, it's probably better for me to pull up my actual stats. Um, but I know active immersion. We can put them in the, we can put them in like yeah. the, the text box under the YouTube thingy. I'm not the right. YouTube guy, by the way, so that's Ben. So, uh, so whatever good. it's called. Uh, yeah, I feel like I, I want to almost like open it. So I don't say the wrong thing, <laughs> I, but if you open it, you know, you'll be like that's looking true. down. And that's <laughs> I'll get I'll get a quick review, guys. Don't I'm just gonna look at it, see it, and then I'll say it to the camera. He's gonna and check his stats for us, okay. y'all. Just really quickly. Uh, I haven't opened this website in a minute. I use okay. First, I use the website called Toggle. Um, some of you guys actually might be familiar with it because in the Korean Discord, I'd always endorse Toggle's the way, Toggle's the way. And I know there's a lot of other people that use Toggle. Yeah, um, we use Toggle at Refill too. Our our awesome. coaching clients use Toggle. Toggle, toggle time tracking, log in. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to provide you guys with the accurate information. I don't want to over oh, yeah, yeah. or uh, You don't want to <laughs> inflate your numbers. Yeah. Log and did you track everything differently? So like, did you break it down? Like this was passive, this was active. Yes. Um, so yeah. Okay, so, so, I so guess that I means you can that. give us both numbers. Right. So I did passive, active, study time let me mm. actually look at it passive, passive active, active study, study time. time and i know i had a couple others i had active listening with visual active listening without did i did i have that okay I'm that makes sense myself. that's sort of yeah. yeah let me see one second and i um, agree listening to a video is different than listening to something without visual right. 
projects. Let's go. Internet's been a little slow. All right, so that time period in which I reported this was, I think I actively had content recorded till July of 2022 is when I had my last full month of immersion. And I guess I can see July 2020. July. Okay. Somewhere around. All right. So actually, okay. So I had a full year that was like probably my most impressive year, but then I had one month. I had this, at least I'll, I'll just mention my last recorded year. Um, I had about 1,700 active listening hours. Then I had, oh, that's what I did. I did active listening, as in active listening without subtitles. And then I did active listening with subtitles. And then from there, I had passive listening. Then we had reading. Then I also started recording shadowing time. And then I recorded speaking time relative to phone calls. And then SRS, SRS time, study time, and writing time. So I had about like four, nine measures. I even might have one more, but nine different measures. Um, my last year, this was from July, July when? July 31st to July 31st, from 2021 to 2022, I had about 1,630 plus active listening, then active with subtitles, I had 560, or roughly, um, passive listening, 1,010 hours, um, reading, 70 hours, I took a very light row on reading that last year, um, shadowing, uh, I had four hours, and then speaking, I had 20 hours. Speaking was 20 hours. SRS time was about 130 hours. And then study time, 150 hours, with writing time being about 50 hours. What's that the grand total? That is a rough breakdown. The grand total was almost 4,000 hours. So 3,925 4, in hours. In one year. Well, if you, yeah. One year. Yeah. That is impressive. <laughs> if I had a hat, I would take it off. Hats off. <laughs> uh, yeah. Wow. Some, some of these hours aren't 100% all allocated. I can still see. Because one some of the things that's like, to toggle. Yeah. I have like three, uh, almost 300 hours that are unassigned, which is a lot. Probably because you have those periods where you're just like, I'm watching something, but I don't have a name for it. I'm watching. Something. I could probably go back and do that, but you know, why? Why do it now? <laughs> why do it? Yeah, yeah. You you sort of um you see this trajectory with a lot of successful immersion learners where like they're really into tracking. They track every single thing they do. Uh, they wear a timer around their neck. They <laughs> yeah. they do all these things. They do their Anki daily religiously, and then they go to their target language country. They get good. They don't feel the need to continue. Yeah, uh, that is a common trope. But that's the one thing that I can almost, I almost felt in myself, but I'm like, I can't stop. Like, I can't stop. I'm not done yet, is what I've been telling myself as of late. Because you reach like a point of comfortability, like, mm -hmm. especially after going to Korea and actively like, because like, if I was to like, even discuss like what I was doing in Korea, I was a part of the Yonsei basketball team. And I even did, um, uh, what's it called? I had, I had classes that were entirely taught in Korean, like political science, on my major is political science. And I was learning poli sci in Korea about Korean history. And we had to even interview Korean, Korean people going out into the world as a group. Um, so like through those experiences, like every day, like really challenging myself. Because I didn't, I wasn't required to take a class in Korean, but I was like, "Hey, I'm going to Korea. I might as well," you know. So like that challenge and kind of like overcoming that, I've almost reached a point where I'm like very comfortable 
but I'm not like, I, I wouldn't even say I'm that good yet. As funny as it sounds. Um, but I'm comfortable, uh, which is kind of scary because you That's don't want to be too comfortable part, because you get comfortable and then you stop and breathe. yeah exactly so that's where i'm kind of trying to figure out how i can challenge myself now to really maintain a level of intensity that is healthy enough to maintain progress but i can still good call like, on know. choosing a healthy path forward right right yeah that's kind of how yeah I'm looking at things now yeah you know uh we are about at time but before we go, Adamola, if you had one piece of advice to give as your parting sage wisdom, what would it be? So the one thing I can tell you guys for a beginner, or even if you're at a point where you've been learning and you're kind of like, oh, I don't know, it really comes down to like holding yourself accountable in one way asking yourself, is this really something I want? Do I truly want this? And then really just keeping yourself to a habit. Because I think the, if you have, you know, like you have a one-to-one -one with yourself, because um, that's what, kind of the challenge I see with like someone who wants to learn a language, but to a degree, you kind of have to look at yourself and say, how badly do I really want to learn this language? Do I, is this something that I just think is cool? Or is this something that I genuinely have a passion for or I have a reason behind it, whether it be self, uh, self motivating or extraneous, like an outside reason. Um, but really, I wouldn't focus too heavily on the when will I be fluent? Oh, can I do it in one 18 months? Can I do it in two years? Because when you start thinking like that, you put like pressure on this idea of immersion or learning that is not really sustainable, in my opinion. Because um, personally, you kind of have to just make sure you enjoy the ride. They say it all the time. It's as cheesy as it gets, but really enjoying what you do every day, figuring out what works for you, finding the path, the content, the everything that you can say, oh, I'll wake you up in the morning. I'm excited to get back at it. That's honestly what I can say has led me to the place I am now. And I wish you guys the same and the best in finding that for yourselves. So yeah, thank you for having me on, you know? Yeah, and thank That's you for it. being here. Thank you for that sage advice. Remember, guys, uh, enjoy the ride. And thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Refold Podcast. I will see you guys again next week. Thanks for coming and listening to this episode of the Refold Podcast. If you're watching the live premiere, you're in luck because we have an after party over in the Refold Central Discord server right after. Come join us by using refold.link forward slash join and chat about the episode. If you enjoyed the podcast and would like to hear more, you can find older episodes to listen to on YouTube and Spotify. Let us know what you thought by liking the video and leaving a comment below. If you have suggestions for upcoming visitors, guests, or even requests for particular topics, please feel free to reach out to me on Discord at georgepig hashtag 5413 or via email at clayton at refold.la. Thank you all for watching or listening, and I'll see you next week.